All right, here's the Monte Carlo uh, presentation. So this is a this is a method that you know has become more and more popular as computers have gotten faster and faster. So there's there's other methods that exist out there other than the Monte Carlo method. First order, second moment is one of them, uh, and lots of others that. Um, some of which have gone by the wayside a little bit because once you get a little bit of experience and practice uh, and comfort with doing Monte Carlo methods, um, they're really easy to implement um, for a whole array of general problems. So that's, and like I said, they're, they can be computationally uh, intensive, but you know, with current computer powers, even with, you know, just a, a laptop computer. Um, you can solve a lot of problems uh, using the Monte Carlo method. So a couple objectives here. One is just to get you familiar with three of the common types of problems we solve with the Monte Carlo method. Um, talk about some of the details on how it works. So how we actually generate um, the random samples that we need for Monte Carlo and then uh, how to actually do a Monte Carlo simulation, which you'll do in the exercise tomorrow. So we'll cover the Monte Carlo method, uh, some of the sampling methods we use, and then just talk very briefly on some uh, thoughts and concepts related to post-processing results of a Monte Carlo. So what is the Monte Carlo method? So the Monte Carlo method is just, a, it's just an algorithm or a set of computational procedures where we use repeated sampling to get a numerical solution for a particular type of problem. Oftentimes we need to use it or other methods um, because there is no, um, either there is no analytical solution, so we can't solve it directly with math or the analytical solution is so cumbersome that it's just easier and faster just to do it with the Monte Carlo method. The key concept with Monte Carlo method is the repeated sampling, which we'll talk about on the next slide when we kind of talk about the general framework of, of a Monte Carlo analysis. Three types of problems that are most commonly um, solved with Monte Carlo. One is optimization, which is, you know, things like finding maxima and minima uh, functions. So the exercise we did where we did distribution fitting using maximum likelihood estimation, um, where we let the Excel solver find the solution, you can also find the solution using um, Monte Carlo. Oftentimes the challenge with optimization types of problems is um, Monte Carlo, at least a, a standard Monte Carlo or a naive Monte Carlo is pretty inefficient, so it's usually not the best option. But if you're using more advanced um, Monte Carlo algorithms, which I'll just introduce you to at the end of this presentation, um, you can, it makes it more tractable for doing optimization. Um, integration, so solving integrals. So essentially, you know, the concept of area under a curve. So solving the, say the risk equation, which is an integral um, of the combination of a, you know, a hazard uh, system response and consequences can be solved with Monte Carlo. And then uncertainty is, is probably the most common application where we have some model, right, that has some input variables. It calculates something, right? So we have some sort of output. And then we can run our model deterministically, or we can say, okay, but our inputs to the model have uncertainty. Um, how does that uncertainty propagate through the model? And how can we figure out what the uncertainty is in our output, given the uncertainty that we have in our inputs? So Monte Carlo is a real easy way to, to propagate um, uncertainty through your models. So the general framework for Monte Carlo, uh, most Monte Carlos follow this same framework. So the first step is to build a model. So if you think of this as, you know, build, building any sort of deterministic model, right? You would build that just like you would otherwise if you were doing a deterministic calculation. So if you were doing, you know, uh, sliding stability analysis for a concrete monolith where you had, you know, water as a driving force, you know, uh, friction 
along the foundation contact as a re resisting force uplift and whatever other forces you might have, right? You would, and you were calculating, you know, a factor of safety or a margin of safety. Um, you would build that model just like you would now. Uh, the second step is where the kind of the Monte Carlo part kicks in is you then decide that some of your inputs are have uncertainty and you assign probability distributions to those inputs uh, that represent that uncertainty. So again, the simple example of like a sliding model of stability, maybe you have uncertainty in the unit weight of concrete uh, of your dam, maybe you have uncertainty in the friction angle at the contact between the dam and the foundation and whatever else you'd like to put uncertainty on, you can, right? That are inputs to that model. You then generate random samples of the model inputs. So you generate a set of random samples for all the inputs to your model uh, based on their probability distributions that you've given to them. You then plug those into your model and calculate the results of your model and record those results. So again, the concrete dam example, you would randomly sample, say, a friction angle and a unit weight of concrete, plug that into all the formulas in your model. Uh, you would get out of that, you know, either a factor of safety or margin of safety or some other output, and you then record that output. You then do that again, right? So you generate another independent random sample of all the inputs, calculate the factor of safety, record it, and do it again. And you repeat that many, many you know, often thousands to tens of thousands of times. Um, and then once you do that, you take the collection of all those recorded model outputs and you evaluate them in some way. So you might calculate, you know, if I ran the model a thousand times and my factor of safety was less than one, um, 100 times, right? Then I would say, okay, that's 100 times out of a thousand, so that means there is a 10% probability that my factor of safety um, is below the limit state of one, right? So you can, you know, again, this will work with all kinds of different models. Um, if you can build a model, you can um, put a Monte Carlo framework on top of it. So for optimization problems, this is just an example of, of and it'll be a little graphic on the next slide too that kind of show at least conceptually how this works. So again, this is the maximum likelihood type of problem that we did in the earlier exercise. So what is the best estimate for mean and standard deviation using MLE, assuming the data are independent and have a normal distribution? So uh, in this type of application, um, the Monte Carlo works sort of like a guess and check kind of approach. So you guess the parameters with Monte Carlo randomly you then calculate the likelihood as your check. You do that many, many, many times. Uh, and then you search through your results and you find the guess that had the highest likelihood. And that is your estimate. Um, so here's what that looks like kind of conceptually. So you have two parameters, mean and standard deviation. You're making random guesses for combinations of mean and standard deviation with a Monte Carlo. You're then calculating the likelihood for all of those points. And then we can represent that with a heat map, right, where the, the darker red colors are a higher likelihood and the blue colors are a lower likelihood. And then from our set of samples that we've generated, you can find the value that has the highest likelihood, which is indicated by this diamond here. And then that would be your, your estimate that would come out of the Monte Carlo. But again, I don't know if you pick it up visually on here, but you can see that it often takes lots and lots and lots of samples if you're just using a, a just a basic Monte Carlo where you're just generating random random estimates. But it is doable. The other one is uh, integration, which I mentioned. So here's a, just an example of how integration works. So remember, again, conceptually, integration, think of it as being the area under a function. And it can be, you know, one dimension, two dimension, or however many dimensions you like. It's just a simple one dimensional case. Um, and remember that the area under a function or the integral, you can estimate it if you know what the, uh, the say the base width is. So in this case, the base width would be along our x axis here. 
So from zero to one, so our base width for this function would be one. And if you know that the average height of what it is you're calculating the area of, right? So if we can figure out what the average height is of this function, right? We can take the base width times the average height and that'll give us the area under this curve, right? Which is the integral. So, you know, you think of it like uh, the area of a triangle, right? Where does the, where does the formula one half base times height come from for the area of the triangle? Well, it comes from multiplying the base times the average height. What's the, the average height of a triangle is one half of the height, right? So that's where one half BH comes from. So we can apply that concept to any function that has any shape if we can estimate its average height, right? And we know what its base is. So Monte Carlo is one of the ways to do that. So in Monte Carlo, what we would do is we would generate independent random samples of points along this function um, using a Monte Carlo. And then we would calculate the value of the function at each of those points, which you know we can interpret that as being the height, right? And then if we take enough of those, we can then essentially calculate the average of all those functional values. And that should give us an estimator of the average height of this function. Right, so that's what this this um, first term here is. We're basically um, calculate. We're generating these random points on the curve, calculating the value of the function represented by these vertical lines. Um, that is the height at that point. Uh, if we take it across all these estimates, right, we can sum them up, divide by the total number of estimates we've made. That should give us an estimate of the average, right, which is essentially, think of it being the average height of this function, and then multiply it by the base width, which is this dx value, which in this example would be one, and we should get an estimate of the area under this function, which another, I guess, good thing to know is that um, when we're doing, in this example, it's a damage estimate, right? The, this is uh, the cumulative distribution, or the, sorry, the survival function for annual damage. And the area or integral of a survival function or a um, cumulative distribution function, the area under that function or its integral is equal to the mean value. So if these are, if this is our distribution of annual damage expressed as a survival function or as an exceedance probability, if we can calculate the, the, the integral of this function or the area under it, that will give us the expected annual damage. So that's how Monte Carlo works for integration. How it works for propagating uncertainty. So here's a coastal example. So this is what's the probability that this dune will overtop given that we have uncertainty in the total water level. So the total water level uh, in, in coastal engineering is, is basically the still water level, which includes the tide plus um, the surge, or you, or you might hear uh, referred to as setup, right, that's due to wind, and then um, run up, which is due to waves breaking on the dune and, and running up the slope. So that's total water level. So we have a system here where we have a capacity, and, and if you've done reliability engineering, usually you'll see terms like capacity versus demand. So think of capacity like the strength or resistance of the thing you're modeling. So in this case, our capacity is the top elevation of the dune, right? That's how much, that's how high the water can get before it overtops. So that's our capacity. And then the demand is how much water we're putting on it. So the demand is the total water level. So in this example, we have those three inputs, right? Tide plus surge plus runup, each of which, um, you know, we would normally just add them together to get the total water level. But now we say, well, what if they have uncertainty? So these are just, you know, possible uncertainty distributions in those three inputs. So we have uh, cumulative distribution functions for uh, tide, which could be um, positive or negative um, surge due to wind and runoff. So what we do in a Monte Carlo is we generate random samples for each of these um, inputs to our model. And then for each of, each of these sets of um, samples, right? So we generate a sample for tide, one for surge, one for runup. We then add them together to get a total water level. That's the output of our model. 
we do it again and again and again and again. In this case, we did it a thousand times. And um, we take all of our total water levels that we've calculated, and then we can start to do some post-processing on it. So in this one, if we're interested in estimating what the probability of this dune overtopping is, we take all of our total water levels that we've generated in the Monte Carlo, we compare them to the top of the dune elevation, which is two, and we count how many of our, in how many of our, our realizations did we have a total water level that was greater than two. So we did a thousand total, and in 47 of those cases, so there were 47 points here to the right and above uh, two meters for total water level. Um, we had 47 of those, so we can take 47 over 1,000 or estimate roughly that the probability of overtopping is 0.05. So again, that's that's how um, Monte Carlo works in terms of we have a model, we have uncertainty in the inputs, and we need to estimate the uncertainty in, in the outputs. Um, this is how conceptually how you do it with Monte Carlo. Okay, so sampling methods that drive the engine of Monte Carlo. So in Monte Carlo, we talked about this already the other day, law of large numbers. So we need lots and lots of samples to, to the, converge to the solution. So this is for the dune problem we just saw. This is the estimate of probability of the dune overtopping versus how many times we ran the Monte Carlo. See, so again, you can see with just a few realizations, it's not very good, varies quite a bit, right? But within a few hundred, and certainly by the time we get to a thousand, we've kind of settled in pretty closely to the estimate. Um, the other key concept that, that we need to understand when doing Monte Carlo is that we use have to use random number generators to generate these random samples of the inputs to our model. So a random number generator is just some computational procedure or algorithm that generates a sequence of numbers whose properties um, mimic the properties of random numbers. So there aren't really true uh, random numbers, so we call them pseudo-random numbers usually because in in principle, if you know what the algorithm is, you can you can know what the sequence of numbers is going to be. So in that sense, they're not truly random, but in the in the sense that they have the same properties of a random number, which is what we care about, um, they are random. So we call them pseudo-random for that reason. Um, Mersenne Twister is probably one of the more commonly used algorithms that's been around for a while. The reason it's still around is because it's reasonably robust for a lot of typical applications. There are much better random number generators out there, but um, Mer Mersenne Twister was one of the first good ones, and so it's kind of stuck and a lot of people still use it. I think this is what's used in X Microsoft Excel, I think uses this algorithm for its random number um, generating function. So here's an example just to show you how, just conceptually how random number generators work. So this, this particular type is called a linear congruential generator. So it uses the mod function, which is basically, um, it's dividing and keeping the remainder is what mod means. So it has um, R, which is your random number uh, and parameters A, B, and M. So in this type of example, your first random number is one, so R0 is one. If you plug that into this formula with the other three parameters, you get uh, A is six, so six times one plus B is 12. So you get six times one plus six, right? That's 12, and then um, your M is 10. So 12 mod 10 means 12 divided by 10 and keep just the remainder. So the remainder of 12 divided by 10 is, is two. Right, so that gives you this two is your second random number, and you repeat the process. You plug the two in here, you get um, two times six, which is 12, plus six, which is 18, divided by 10. 18 divided by 10, the remainder of that would be eight, so that's your next number. So you can look at this random number sequence. Anyone, if you wanna participate, either shout out or type in the chat. Do you see anything, uh, do you observe anything interesting about this um, or relevant about this sequence of random numbers generated from this this um, this algorithm. Anything jump out at you? Repeating. All right. So we have a winner. Repeating.
So this one, you can see it quickly starts to repeat, right? That's really bad, right? So this is a terrible random number generator. And so that's one of the characteristics we look at that we that we don't want in a random jump number generator. We don't want repeating values and we don't want values to have any kind of um, correlation in them. So there's various tests. We're not going to cover them here, but there's various tests that can test the robustness of a random number generator. And again, Mersin Twister is pretty well accepted as a pretty robust one for most applications. Okay, next concept we need to cover and understand to, to be able to do Monte Carlo is inverse transform sampling. So what inverse transform sampling allows us to do is, um, is that we know that the um, cumulative distribution function for a random variable, so we usually represent that with a capital F, and that's the non-exceedance probability, right? So we've seen some of those examples of that throughout the week. So knowing that the um, cumulative distribution values, so the, the non-exceedance probabilities for a random var variable are normally distributed uniformly between zero and one. So their values go from zero to one and they have a uniform um, distribution. So we can take advantage of that and say, okay, well, I can generate random numbers between zero and one, right? That's kind of an easy, consistent way to generate these random samples. So I can have an algorithm that generates random numbers between zero and one. I can then treat that random sample as if it's um, the value of, of the non-exceedance probability, right? I can then plug that probability into my cumulative distribution function and get back the value, the corresponding value of my random variable. So think of this as a as a cumulative distribution function here in the plot where the x-axis is your value of your random variable and the y-axis is your non-exceedance probability. So if I generate a random sample or a random number between 0 and 1 that's uniformly distributed, I can then um, find the corresponding value of x from my distribution function that goes with that random number. So I think there's uh, should be an animation. And yeah, so this is just a short little animation that kind of shows how this works, right? So with each random number I generate between zero and one, I can generate a corresponding value of X by plugging it into the distribution function. Um, and if I do that enough times, um, and I look at the distribution of the X values that I've generated, um, that distribution will, uh, match the distribution that I've defined by the cumulative distribution function. So here's a just a simple conceptual example um, showing what that looks like. So in this example, we have a, um, I think this is using a standard normal. So standard normal has a, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, right? So what we do is we sample random numbers between zero and one, which, you know, algorithms like Mercy and Twister do that easily for us. For each one of those random samples, we treat that as if it's a non-exceedance probability. Plug it into the cumulative distribution function for our normal distribution that we've assigned to our X variable. And in this example, we've just kept it simple and said, you know, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, and we get a corresponding value of X. So we do that, you know, however many times we did in this example, maybe it's a thousand times. And if we then plot the histogram for those X values, right, if we've done enough samples, our X values that we've generated should uh, follow the normal distribution that we had assigned to it originally, right, which is a normal with the mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So if you look at this histogram, it looks 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 about right. Um, so the power of this is we can define any, you know, any, it can be parametric, it can be non-parametric, you know, it can be discrete variable, it can be continuous variable. But if we can define a cumulative distribution function for our variable, normal, log normal, exponential, any distribution you like, we can generate random samples this way using this method by just simply generating random numbers between zero and one, plugging them into the distribution function and calculating a corresponding sample for X. 
So a very, very powerful tool when it's really the main engine that drives Monte Carlo. Another way that's less common, but if you're if you're with the Corps of Engineers, our HEC FDA software uses this other method. So parameter sampling, where you can draw random samples if you know what the sampling distribution is of your parameters. So for simple distributions like the normal distribution, um, we know what the sampling distribution should look like for the mean and the standard deviation. So you may have seen or heard of this at some point where um, the uncertainty in the mean is normally distributed, right, with the mean estimate equal to the mean and a standard deviation equal to the standard deviation over the square root of the number of samples. And the variance, um, the uncertainty in the variance is um, related to a chi-squared distribution. That's what this uh, denominator here is. This is representing the chi-squared distribution. So if you know what if you know what those are, right, then you can use uh, sampling directly from these um, known sampling distributions. But for distributions beyond the normal, it's it's pretty rare for this to be available. So it's not used all that often. Um, the other one that's used frequently is bootstrap, called bootstrap sampling, and we won't go through this in great detail. But just so you've heard of it, um, so software in the core of engineers like HEC Watt. Um, and RMC RFA and RMC Total Risk, which is a new software that'll be coming out soon. They all use the bootstrap sampling. Um, so bootstrap sampling um, can be useful if you wanna sample um, from frequency curves where you don't, uh, where, that have unknown um, sampling distributions. So, uh, what you can do here is you can draw random samples from your fitted distribution using the same inverse transform sampling method where the number of samples is equal to the effective record length or the effective number of data. So in this example, we have a flow frequency curve that we fit to some 50, I think it's 50 years of observed data. So to do the bootstrap method, you would draw random samples from this frequency curve um, and you would draw 50 of them using that inverse transform sampling method. And then for each of those samples, so the yellow here in the middle represents one of, one of those random samples of 50 values from that distribution, you would then refit those random samples to a new distribution. So you'd calculate a new fit, and then that would give you a sample of the entire frequency curve. And then you just repeat that process, right? Um, and each one of those times you do that, you get a new realization or a new sample of the frequency curve. And if you do that enough times, um, you can then take that collection of sampled frequency curves and produce um, confidence intervals on the frequency curve, uh, over the entire frequency curve. So, in um, in risk analysis, we often we often use this method to sample hazard curves, whether they be flood or seismic, where we're sampling a re realization of the entire frequency curve, and then calculating essentially a, an estimate of the expected annual damage off that frequency curve. Um, so that's that's another technique that's out there that you'll find in some of the software. And then uh, one minor thing I'll met I'll mention is this is a generalized method. It'll work with lots and lots of different parametric distributions. Um, it does have a minor limitation if your sample size is small. Um, this only has a first level order of accuracy. So it is. Um, it can be biased uh, when you have small samples. Usually not that big of a problem in practice, but it, 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 it is something to consider. And there are higher order bootstrap methods that can um, reduce the amount of bias. All right, next thing uh, we'll talk about is sampling error. So a really important concept in Monte Carlo analysis, analysis is sampling error. So it's this, this issue of have we satisfied the law of large numbers? Do we have enough um, realizations to have confidence that we've converged to the solution? So this is a, a classic example that's used to teach the Monte Carlo method. It's, it's using Monte Carlo to estimate the value of pi. So different ways you can do it. In this example, we do it as a as a quarter a quarter circle, um, in a within inscribed within a unit square. So we know that the area should be the integral of this uh, function f of x. 
right, which is, is, is defines the circle. Um, we know that the function is for a circle is x squared plus y squared equals the radius squared. So we can, um, we can rearrange that to be in the format of f of x, which is the square root of one minus x squared, right? So that's essentially the equation of a circle. If we integrate that, that should give us the area under this function, right? Which should give us the area of this quarter circle. Um, we can then estimate, or, or we then know that pi is equal to four times the area of that, um, of that um, quarter circle divided by r squared. And then, so then we can then estimate pi, right? So if we can estimate the area under this function, which we can in Monte Carlo, we can estimate um, from that area, we can plug it in and estimate the area of pi. Um, so, the question is in Monte Carlo is how many, how many samples do we need to get a good estimate of pi? So, one of the ways you can test um, Monte Carlo for sampling errors, you can essentially run it in two steps. So, the first step would be you would select a number of realizations, let's say it's a thousand, and you would run it and get an estimate of pi. You would then repeat that again and do it independently for another thousand and do a second estimate of pi. And you would repeat that many, many times and get lots of estimates of pi. And then you would look and say, okay, given I'm doing a thousand realizations, how much uncertainty do I have in my estimate of pi? And this is what that looks like visually, just with an example doing this um, estimation of pi problem. So let's say I do a hundred samples to estimate pi and I repeat that 300 times to see how, how much variability I, I'm going to get in my estimate of pi if I only do 100 samples. And you can see here, you know, you can see it on the plot here from, you know, 2.8 to 3.4. What if I up that to 1,000, right? So what if I do 1,000 random samples to try to estimate pi? And again, to, to visualize the uncertainty, I need to repeat that 300 times. So you can see I get uh, much less sampling error, so much, much less variability in my estimate. And then if I do 10,000 and I repeat that 300 times, you can see I'm honing in pretty close, right? You know, the, the potential error in my estimate of pi that I would get from a Monte Carlo is getting small. But again, you can see, depending on how small you want the error to be, um, the number of Monte Carlo realizations you need can get quite large. Okay, so highlight just a couple advanced methods and then we'll wrap things up. So um, these are just a few of the more advanced techniques for doing Monte Carlo. Um, important sampling, stratified sampling, and Markov chain. Monte Carlo, you'll see each of these used in various software packages, including some of the software packages within USACE. Um, and the real, the real reason for these methods and, and why we use them is because they're faster. So, and what that basically means is we need, um, they, they're, they give us shortcuts to where we need less random samples to converge to the solution. So for applications where you need many, many samples, um, this makes it faster. So I'll just, again, with some, just some visual graphics kind of show you kind of conceptually how these work. So important sampling. So if you're doing, let's say, floods or earthquakes, and you're interested in extreme floods and extreme earthquakes, if those are the events that are most relevant, so you're talking like, you know, a one in a hundred flood or a one in a thousand earthquake or whatever it might be. If you just do direct sampling, right, those samples happen rarely, right? So if you're interested in one in a hundred and you're generating uniform random samples, you're, you're only going to see that event pop up one out of every 100 samples, right? So you're going to have 99 of, your, of every 100 samples might not give you much useful information, right? So the way we, one of the ways we can make that faster is we only sample the stuff that's important, right? So that's why it's called important sampling. So in this example, we might say, well, let's only let's only sample things from the space of floods greater than the two-year flood or with an AEP less than 0.5, so the, the blue shaded area to the right. Um, so now we can get twice as, you know, we can get the same information from half as many samples because we've essentially eliminated half of the sample space, right, if we don't care about anything more frequent than the two-year flood in this example. 
So we basically uh, cut the number of samples we need roughly in half, which should make it roughly twice as fast. Now, when you do these types of methods, you do have to, you know, we're not going to go into details here, but you, you do have to do adjustments then on the back end to account for the fact that you've tossed out half of the sample space. So the rate, the rate that it, events get sampled in your model is not the same as their true rate in, in the real world. So there's some relatively simple adjustments you make to your samples um, to correct for that. Stratified sampling is the second one. So stratified also helps with rare events. So again, even if you do important sampling, you're still sampling the rare events relatively infrequently. So what you can do, as the name implies, is stratify your sample space. So again, this, this brings us all the way back to day one where we talked about the law of total probability, which kind of allows us to do this. Um, so we can take you know, the events that we're interested in and stratify them into bins. And then what we can do is we can sample um, a specified number of events from every bin. So what that does for us is then, you know, if we're way out here in one in a thousand or one in a, a 10,000 land for the events where we care about, um, you can generate those rare events um, with every set of samples that you do. So you don't have to wait that, you know, one in 10,000 only happens one every 10,000 samples, right? Now it have it, you can have it happen every realiza realization because you're telling the model to sample within these bins every time. Um, so again, that speeds things up tremendously. But again, you know, you're basically modifying the sample space, so you have to apply the law of total probability to make adjustments um, to your samples because the rate they get sampled in the model is not going to be the correct rate. Uh, Latin hypercube is probably the most famous um, and most commonly used example of stratified sampling. It's what's used in um, at risk. Um, so there's a question in the chat on at risk, how it comes up with the sample values. I actually don't know off the top of my head. I mean, it uses inverse transform sampling, um, but I'm not sure off the top of my head what um, random number generator algorithm it uses. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it uses Mersenne Twister, but I, I actually don't know which one it uses. But it, it uses the same method. It's going to use inverse transform sampling to generate a uniform random number and then apply it to the distribution function to get the, the random sample of the variable. Um, I think by default, at risk also uses Latin hypercube sampling um, when it's um, generating those uniform random numbers. Um, so in this example here, this just shows just visually some of the efficiencies you can get with stratified sampling. So in this example, um, this is using at risk with the Latin hypercube as the default is the graphic on the right hand side, and you can turn that off and run it. That's the graphic on the left hand side. So, um, Latin hypercube is a specific type, has specific rules for how it stratifies the sample space to do the samples. But as you can see here in the picture, if these were sampled from a uniform distribution between zero and one for a thousand samples, right, you can see the one on the right does a much, much better job of um, reproducing that uniform distribution than the one on the left, right? The one on the left is pretty good, right? It's, it's probably good enough for most applications but the one on the right is better. And so what that's gonna mean is it's, it's gonna run, it's gonna converge faster. Um, and I think in at risk, that's, uh, that's, it's set to use Latin hypercube by default, but you can change those settings. Last one I'll talk about is a really high, a really advanced method that, again, we won't go into details, but there is some software that uses it, particularly Bayesian, software that does Bayesian analysis, um, uses Markov chain Monte Carlo. And uh, the way to think about Markov chain Monte Carlo is um, this is a just a conceptual example where you have two parameters for a distribution, mean and standard deviation. And the contour on here, think of it as being representative of either likelihood or probability. So what we're trying to find here, this is for a distribution fitting example. We're trying to use Bayes' theorem and fit a distribution to find the best estimate for mean and standard deviation. So that would be the value that has the highest likelihood or would be the top of this peak. Um, so the way the way it works is it it's, it does a search 
and it does a smart search in the sense that once it starts to find, uh, if you can, if you think of this conceptually like you would like if this was terrain, right? This is think of this like a hill, and you're trying to find the top of the hill. So the the algorithm is smart in that it'll start to search randomly, and then when it starts to find something that looks like a hill, it'll say, "Okay, hey, I think I found something that looks like I'm on the on this hill. I'm going to." then start to hone in my search around this area, right? And it it knows, um, has a process where it decides, you know, which direction to go based on whether, uh, as it starts to figure out which way is up and which way is down in terms of up or down the hill, right? So that allows it to focus its search around where the hill is and not waste a bunch of time searching where we know the hill doesn't exist. So what that looks like conceptually, right, is here is it kind of starts off a little bit random and then starts to say, hey, I think I may have found something, you know, and then it starts to hone in its search in that area. And then it doesn't doesn't have to waste a bunch of samples out in this space where we're not going to we're not going to learn anything. These are incredibly efficient. Um, this algorithm in, in particular is uh, is for Bayesian analysis makes it feasible. Uh, so I'll just say that even even with modern computers, um, doing a Bayesian fit using just a naive brute force Monte Carlo is is uh, almost not doable unless you have a supercomputer. So algorithms like this exist and and make it such that you can do these types of analyses on a laptop because they're so much more efficient. But again, if you're just doing a you know run of the mill typical Monte Carlo. You know, maybe you're doing stability analysis for a dam or whatever it might be, right? Normally, normally it's just the regular old naive brute force Monte Carlo is fast enough. But um, these type of methods do exist for some of the higher order applications. All right, post processing. Don't have a whole lot to say here. I covered a little bit uh, throughout, um, but it depends on your application how you want to how you want to post process. So in an optimization problem like fitting with maximum likelihood, you would take all of your parameter sets, all of their corresponding likelihoods, and you would just do a, a, a search to find which one gave you the maximum likelihood, right? And that would be your estimate. Um, for integration, um, again, I talked about it in the example, right? You would, if you're integrating a function, you know, your samples are basically the value of the function. So you would take the average of all those samples conceptually, you can think of that as being like the average height of the function. And then you can, you know, multiply it by the base to get the area, which in the example we saw was a way to get um, an estimate of expected annual damage from, you know, the, the uncertainty distribution of annual damages. And then uncertainty, again, depending on what it is you want and what it is you're portraying. If you're doing a risk estimate, you, you know, that has uncertainty, you might wanna calculate and report the mean estimate that's typically the one we want to calculate and report to decision makers. And then if you want to show uncertainty in the risk estimate, you know, you can do it a whole host of ways. You could just calculate the variance in the risk estimate as a numerical metric. You could do, you know, various scatter plots um, or confidence intervals um, to show the uncertainty in a risk estimate, or you could actually plot um, the actual distribution. I think we saw an example of that yesterday in one of the slides where we showed um, the uncertainty distribution in the um, in the annual benefits, right? And you could you could show it that way. So lots of lots of different ways to do it. But again, always uh, always be aware of convergence. You know, oftentimes software like you know a lot of the core software like HEC FDA and uh, and and RMC Best Fit and some of the other software is kind of designed. Um, it's either designed on the conservative side so that the defaults will should pretty much always give you good convergence, or it actually has some convergence um, criteria built into it. I think FDA has that, whereas it will check convergence along the way, and then when it meets whatever criteria is in there, it will then stop. Um, but always be aware that, you know, the example I did there for calculating pi, you know, is just a good kind of conceptual example of, of what to be aware of in terms of um, convergence. But again, you know, if you have a model that runs fast, you know, and you can run 10,000 uh, realizations, you know, most of the time that's going to be enough for, for
for convergence. All right, uh, let me make sure I didn't miss anything here in the chat on questions. So it looks like the only question was the one about um, how at risk does it sample. So yeah, it, the, the inverse transform sampling is pretty pretty much universal. And uh, like I said, the default for its, when it does the um, random number generation is it, it uses a Latin hypercube stratified sampling method. Oh, I have two little demos I can show you. One is on autocorrelation to kind of show how correlation affects the um, affects the the plots we looked at the other day, and I also have the um, the uh, estimation of pi example um, worked out in a spreadsheet. Okay, so this one is is about the lag plot. This first demo, and this is just a little little. You know, we call them toy problems, so it's like little demonstration problems you can do to kind of tinker with these things and experiment with them. I, I do this sort sort of thing a lot, and you know, of course, it depends on your own personal learning style um, and how you like to learn things. But for me, like getting getting in the sandbox and playing around um, is is always really effective for me personally. So if that if that works for you and suits your learning style, I would encourage you to. You know all these concepts we cover this week is you know when you have some time you know feel free to tinker around and you know tinker with little toy problems like this to kind of help help you digest some of this material more so this is an example where we can we can set up a um an experiment here where we can generate um correlated data um, so that we can look at and see what correlation does to these lag plots so this is just a simple example from a normal distribution. So we're generating um, random samples um, from a normal distribution. We're generating two sets of, or sorry, one set of data, and then we're going to do the lag one data and, and see how that plays out. So, you know, you can pick whatever distribution you like, whatever values you like in this one. I picked a normal distribution with a mean of 15, a standard deviation of five, and then you can enter um, I don't know, Do I, maybe I should zoom in a little bit here. Um, and then this R is the, is, the, is the Pearson's correlation coefficient, which the user can edit and change however they like. And then E is, a, e is, the, um, is, uh, is an error term. So E is related to the, to the correlation coefficient. So what we can do here is we can generate um, random samples from a standard normal, um, and we're going to do that in Z space since it's the standard normal, right? So the way we do that is RAND is the is, um, Excel's random number generator for a uniform random number between 0 and 1. And then we then apply that random number. We treat that as if it's a probability, and we put it in the, in the, in the CDF function for the normal distribution, which um, is norm.s.inv for the standard normal, right? So this is inverse transform sampling here. Random number between zero and one, plug it into the normal um, CDF function for the standard normal. So that, that gives us a set of, of random variables. Um, the reason we do it in Z space is because we can use what's called a copula to generate um, correlated samples. So if you wanted to do independent samples, you would just have this formula and copy it all the way down. But if we want to be able to put some correlation in from one sample to the next, um, the technique we're using here that we don't cover in this course, but it's called a Gaussian copula. So Gaussian because it's based off the normal distribution. So there's a it, it, there's a little simple formula for that, and it's basically um, what you do is you take um, the previous value um, times this um, correlation um, coefficient. And then you add that to a term that is basically a um, new, um, essentially an error term, right? So it's it's an error term that comes from the, the normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation equal to this E value. So that will give us a sequence of, of random samples that are correlated based on whatever correlation value we input here. Um, if we put it as zero, zero means no correlation, right? So these will these should 
mimic independent random samples. If we put a value, I don't think it'll allow me to put one XO. Yeah, one won't work. But if we put a number really close to one, right, we should see that all our samples are almost exactly the same, right? Because they're perfectly correlated, which basically means that the, the current value almost exactly determines the next value, right? So you get a sequence of values that are all the same, right? If I do negative one, or sorry, won't let me do, yeah, it won't let you do exactly. So if you do negative one, it basically will um, oscillate back and forth. And then if you do zero, it's just a random scatter. Uh, and then same as we do, you know, lag, the lag values are just those values shifted by one. And then um, since these are Z values, we want to convert them to the actual uh, values of our random variable X that has a mean of 15 and a standard deviation of one. So what we do there is we can calculate the corresponding um, probability value um, for our random value of Z. So we have, so now we're going the other direction, right? We have a random value of Z and we want to calculate the corresponding um, non-exceedance probability from a standard normal. And then from that, we treat that as if it's the cumulative probability for our random variable that has a mean and a standard deviation of five. So we plug that into the normal function to get a random sample of X. So at the end of all this, we have random samples of X, and then we have the lag X values just shifting them by one, and we generate our lag plot the same we have previously. So you can you can play around with, you know, to show this autocorrelation visually, you can play around with this R value. So zero is, is um, means the sample should be independent. And in here, I also have a cell that calculates the actual correlation coefficient. Now it won't be exactly the same as the R value because there's sampling error, right? There's only, I think there's a hundred samples in this spreadsheet. Um, but if the number of samples got really large, this the actual correlation of your samples would converge to the, the specified correlation eventually, but it should be close, right? So we specified zero, we got 0.08, that's pretty close. So this is data that's not autocorrelated, it's independent. Right, you can see kind of the scatter you get and you say, okay, what if I start putting in a correlation coefficient? So what if I put in 0.5, you know, which means it's somewhat correlated. So you can see how the plot changes. And again, these ones visually for me are always tough because it's like, okay, is that a lot of scatter or a little scatter? But when you compare it to zero, right, it's, it's definitely less scatter, starting to coalesce around the line. And you can continue to increase R value 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0.8, and hopefully you can start to see how the values are starting to coalesce around that line, that one-to-one -one line. And you get up to 0 0.9, you know, 0 0.95, 0 0.99, right? They're starting to really condense. So that's kind of, you can see how the behavior of this plot, and the same thing should happen. Or, um, oh yeah, so in the negative direction, you gotta be, uh, let's see. Yeah, in the negative direction, they actually, you actually have to, if you have negative correlation, you actually need to do this as a, um, uh, these will coalesce around a negative one-to-one -one line. So um, you just imagine a di diagonal line going the other direction through the, through the square there. Um, so again, you can, you can increase the correlation and you'll see it. Um, if you imagine that diagonal line, it's, it'll coalesce around that negative one-to-one -one line. Oh, and yeah, XO won't let you do one, one or, well, it's not XO, it's this formula that um, the copula for doing the correlated samples, you can't put in a, it can't be exactly one or exactly negative one. Um, okay, so that's the first demo. The second demo, let's see if I have it open here. Second demo is just the spreadsheet, and and we'll post. I'll post. We'll post these to the website at the end of the week, so you can download them and have them if you want them. Um, so this is um, two ways, two different ways to estimate pi using Monte Carlo. So this first way is, um, I mean, they're both the same conceptually in that you know you can do this any number of ways, but the math is easy if you do a quarter circle inscribed in a unit square. Right, so essentially a radius of one. And, and what you do here is, in this particular case, is th these, these values here, just they just define the coordinates of the 
orbit circle, right? So you get this nice smooth looking line on here for the circle. Over, over here on the right is where we're doing the actual Monte Carlo. So what you do is again, inverse, uh, inverse transform sampling. We're generating uh, a random number here between zero and one. In this case, technically you can generate a random number between zero and the radius, but we picked a radius of one. So these are random numbers between zero and one. Uh, you then using the, um, you then generate random, a random y, y coordinate. And again, uh, within the unit square between zero and one, or between zero and the radius. You then calculate um, the value of, of this um, function for a circle, x squared plus y squared. And then you can check to see if um, the random point you generated is inside the circle or outside of the circle, right? So this is just a little if statement that says if this, um, x squared plus y squared is less than the radius, then my point is inside the circle. If it's greater than, it's one of these points here outside the circle. And then what I can do here is I can keep track of that throughout, you know, however many samples I want to do this. I don't know, maybe has, I don't even know how many it has, maybe a couple thousand. Um, but what I can do then is I know the area of the square, right? The area of the square is easy, right? It's just the, the so, uh, the length of a side squared, right? Um, so I can estimate from this based on how many how many points are inside the circle uh, versus the total number of points, right? I can estimate um, what the area of the circle is relative to the area of the square. So that's what this equation or this calculation is doing. Um, it's estimating um, based on how many points are in the circle versus outside. It's using that as a proxy to estimate the area of the circle relative to the area of the square, right? So since the area of the square is known, we can use this to get the area of this, uh, area of this quarter circle. And since we know the formula for the area of a quarter circle, uh, once we get the estimated area of that circle from our Monte Carlo, we can, we can back calculate an estimate of pi. And then all this does here is this just does kind of a, um, a running estimate of pi that we can then plot in terms of showing our estimate of pi versus our number of realizations, All right? So that's one way of doing it. That you'll see that as a classic way it's shown and taught. Um, the other way is the one I talked about in the lecture where you're basically uh, visualizing this as doing an integration, All right? So the area of this quarter circle is the integral of this, is this equation here four times um, the integral from from the zero or from the center to the radius of r squared minus x squared dx. All right, so we can we can again do that the same way we did some of the other demonstrations with Monte Carlo. So again, we need this time we need a random sample for x. So we want to take a random sample along our base, which is x. We then um, instead of calculating a random sample of y, we're actually calculating the value of the function at x, right? So given this random sample of x, what's the corresponding value of y? So if x is 0.13, say roughly here, the corresponding point on the circle is 0.99. And you can carry that through all of these um, examples. We then know from Monte Carlo and how integrals work, right, that our estimate of the area of that curve circle is the base times the average, our estimate of the average height, right? And our estimate of the average height is the average of all the heights we've randomly sampled. So we're taking the average of all the heights we've randomly sampled and multiplying it by the base, right? Which is our, in this example, is our radius. So that's our estimate from Monte Carlo of the area of this quarter circle. And again, this is set up to do a, a kind of a running calculation, right? So that with each realization, you know, it's, it's calculating all the pre all the samples up to that point, right? So that you can kind of see how things improve and converge with more samples. And then again, knowing the equation for area of a quarter circle, we can back out the estimate of pi from that area estimate that we got from Monte Carlo. And again, this is set up to just do a running, essentially a running estimate so that we can then on this plot here on the right, we can show how the estimate of pi um, evolves and eventually will converge to the correct value 
um, with enough realizations. Now, again, you know, if you're doing, uh, imagine if you're an astrophysicist, right, and you need pi accurate to many, many decimal places, this is not the way to do it, right? But for demonstration purposes, you can see that with, you know, complex things like, well, what the heck's the value of pi and how the heck can I estimate it? Um, Monte Carlo is a really powerful tool to get, you know, for an engineer, right? They say, what's, what's, what's the, I guess the joke, right? They ask an engineer what the value of pi is and they, it's 3.14, right? Because that's good enough for everything we do as engineers. So, you know, to get an estimate to the accuracy of 3.14 is really easy to do with, with Monte Carlo. Uh, pi is not easy to estimate otherwise, right? So it can make problems that are a little bit challenging much, much easier um, with Monte Carlo. Those are the two examples I had. Uh, there was a question about these examples. So I, we will post these two spreadsheets on the RMC website with the other training materials.